Okay, welcome again to um, those who have just joined us to this event today, co-hosted by the International Peace Bureau, the Asia-Europe Asia People's Forum, and No to War, No to NATO. Um, my name is Alessandra, and I'm um, chairing the webinar today. So our first webinar took place, um, our first webinar in this series, I should say, took place a few um, weeks ago, um, in which we had some excellent speakers discuss the role of the G20 in the current political climate of confrontation and common security. So in our follow-up um, webinar today, we'll be discussing global NATO, the economic wars against Russia and China, and also um, possible alternatives for cooperation and common security. Um, we'll also have um, some time for a Q&A after our speakers um, and then closing remarks by Kate Hudson. So starting off our discussion today, we have Peter Ball, who is the co-founder of Attack Germany and a member of the directorate of the NGO World Economy, Ecology and Development. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to discuss with you these uh, issues that uh, are in our minds so much at these times. I will treat uh, the issue in five bullet points. Uh, my first point is the weaponizing of economy is not new, but has reached a new quality today. Probably already thousands of years ago, harvests were burned, sources of drinking water were empoisoned in order to damage, to damage the capabilities of an enemy, and vice versa, to use the own economic potential as a way to reach also military superiority. Later on, a famous example is uh, the embargo that, for instance, Napoleon's continental blockade against England. Uh, a spicy note in that context is that uh, the Russian Tsar was participating in this blockade against England initially, but then pulled out. And this was the motivation for Napoleon to send his Grand Armée to Moscow, uh, which uh, then ended, as you all know, in the famous Berezina event. Uh, but this is history. Uh, if you look at the situation today, there is a new quality in the use of economy as a weapon. And I see there are two main reasons. Reason number A is industrialization, which of course is closely linked to the rapid changes in technology. One example, outer space and recently also the cyberspace have become battlefields. And uh, this, of course, is intimately linked to the economic strength of a country. Uh, uh, there are not many countries who are capable uh, to participate in the outer space militarization and also to control the cyberspace. And point B or sub point B is the different waves of economic internal, internalization, internationalization, we call it globalization today, have led to many fold forms of economic interconnection and have established dependencies, some of them symmetric dependencies or asymmetric dependencies. And all this together creates both vulnerabilities and it offers new opportun opportunities to use the economy for geopolitical purposes. To conclude my first uh, bullet point, I would say we are witnessing a general tendency to subordinate more and more directly the economy and the technology to geopolitical interests. In that respect, the economic warfare differs from classical protectionism, whose purpose is only economic although I know the border between both may be uh, in a gray zone. Uh, 
the new quality of uh, the economic warfare can very well be studied in the case of the economic war against Russia. The sanctions are really unprecedented in modern history. They affect trade, finance system, energy and other raw materials. They affect transfer of technology, investments and so on and so forth, practically all dimensions uh, of the economy, with few exceptions, which, by the way, are in some cases uh, very speaking. For instance, Rosatom, uh, the Russian firm for nuclear, for civil nuclear plants and uh, civil nuclear technology, is exempted from sanctions. I will not go into further details. It's a speaking uh, exemption. And uh, the use of the economy as a weapon in the Russian sanctions has now reached an extent that there is even little space for further escalating. The West has shot its powder more or less completely. This was my first bullet point. I come to my second point. What is the purpose of sanctions and the weaponizing of economy? Here I have four sub points. A, the purpose is a change of the behavior of the enemy. In that case of the war, of course, uh, it is uh, the intention that Russia should stop the war. B, punishment or retaliation. A very recent example are the sanctions of the European Union against Iran. Uh, the intention is to punish uh, the Iran for uh, the behavior of the government in the recent internal situation against the protests uh, in Iran. Sub point C, a purpose of sanctions and economic warfare is the destabilization inside of the enemy's society or even up to regime change. At the beginning of the sanctions against Cuba some 40 years ago, I think this was um, important motivation of the sanctions. Uh, and in other cases, for instance, Venezuela in recent time, uh, the destabilization inside uh, a country is uh, one purpose. And uh, Sub point D, my fourth sub point is blocking or hampering the economic development. This is in the center of the economic warfare of China. At the United States, elites have realized that it is too late to kill the baby in the cradle. They now try to stop or at least to hamper the further development of China in all terrains, be it economic, uh, military, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, there are combinations of these different purposes among uh, them. My third bullet point, who is using the economy as a weapon? There is an uneven distribution of the capability to use economy for geopolitical purposes. Have you ever heard of economic sanctions of Cuba against the United States or of Syria against the EU or of Mali against France? The stronger an economy is, the larger is the range for using economic warfare. Your market power, if you have technological monopolies uh, or other elements of monopolistic economic influence, this gives you uh, this arm, this weapon, uh, whereas others who don't dispose it, they don't have it. One could speak of a kind of exclusiveness of economic warfare. In that respect, and of course, only in that respect, it is comparable to nuclear arms, where you have also quite an exclusive club who is disposing of these arms. Uh, and uh, in the economic sector, we have a similar situation. You have quite an exclusive club who can use uh, this weapon. And this, of course, is an expression of the uneven and unjust world economy 
whose roots date back to colonialism and throughout the 19th century imperialism uh, to neocolonial practices in our times. So this was my fourth bullet point on who uses sanctions. My fourth bullet point, what is the success and the efficiency of sanctions and economic warfare? There are quite a number of studies and they all together come with some different accents, of course, to the con conclusion that in the large majority of cases, sanctions and economic warfare do not reach the defined purposes. Uh, from my point of view, there are four aspects which are difficult or even impossible to control for those who use the sanctions, which are the reason why the efficiency of sanctions is very limited. There is point A. In the target country, sanctions very often hit people who bear no responsibility for the sanctions, uh, normal people, which have no influence on foreign policy, on military policy, and so on and so forth, while elites and decision makers are seldom or hardly affected by sanctions. A very uh, prominent example are the sanctions against Syria, uh, where pharmaceutical products, medicine, and so on, are not reaching the country anymore because financing, etc., uh, and trade sanctions are hampering or even uh, avoiding or preventing uh, that pharmaceutical products and medicines come into the country. Uh, so one aspect of this uh, point, the uneven effect of sanctions is uh, that it even create, it creates uh, death or diseases and so on, uh, which might be avoided if there are no sanctions. My sub point B on this question is, there is in many cases an adaptation of the target country to the sanctions through import substitution, for instance. And uh, in the medium or even long range, uh, sanctions might even strengthen the country uh, which uh, was supposed to be weakened by the sanctions. I think uh, Russia in that case is an example. Uh, the first big wave of sanctions after 2014, the Crimea crisis and the Euromaidan crisis, uh, has uh, led to to a strong uh, import substitution in Russia, which has considerably strengthened, for instance, the agricultural sector of Russia. My point C on the effects and uh, the efficiency of sanctions, they often lead to collateral damage against third parties who have nothing to do with the initial conflict. One example is that the present sanctions against Russian Naval transport, such as closing harbors for Russian ships, refusal of insurances of the cargo and the ships. Uh, this triggers then all the speculative effects uh, on the financial markets, which determine the food prices. And in that case, uh, the collateral damage are the poor countries, which depend on food deliveries uh, and where the prices go up. Uh, so they are the main victims. And finally, my fourth sub point on the efficiency of uh, sanctions is what I would call backfiring. This means that uh, those who are using the weapon are themselves becoming uh, more or less, there are differences, of course, victim uh, of the use of this weapon. A typical uh, uh, example is the energy crisis of the EU. And even in this is a short term effect, uh, backfiring effect, uh, and even long term, it might create uh, important effects. For instance, uh, the role of the US dollar 
as the international currency will probably be affected by the finance sanctions against Russia. And hence, a pillar of the US global economy will be affected and will be weakened because more and more countries understand that in case of conflict, it is not so good if you are uh, completely dependent on the dollar as means of international payment. And more and more countries are using bilateral agreements, using their own currency or uh, digital based uh, instruments uh, for their uh, bilateral trade. So in the light of that, the efficiency of economy war against Russia is, uh, of course, creating a lot of damage, but uh, taken the overall purpose, it is a failure too. And uh, <clears throat> it will not bring Russia down to its knees uh, because major economic players do not participate uh, in the economic war. This is a new situation. Uh, which uh, differs from former times that uh, there is uh, Asia as, uh, I would say, the economic, the new economic center of the world economy. And this is why uh, the economic weapon uh, is inefficient inefficient and very costly for those who are using it. This was my fourth uh, bullet point. I now come to my last, the fifth bullet point. What is at stake if this trend continues? One of the basic features of the era we live in is the transformation of the international system from a unipolar hegemonial system under the hegemony of the United States towards a polycentric or multipolar international order. The United States, and I can quote all the presidents, all the basic papers of the US uh, foreign policy community, they do not want this at all. They want to maintain their hegemony, their position, uh, at the top of the international hierarchy, whereas other countries like China, India, Russia, Brazil, Brazil Indonesia, South Africa, and so over, they want this change. Uh, and I think it's a historic tra uh, trend uh, which cannot uh, be stopped uh, anymore. The existing hierarchy in the international system is eroding. Of course, this creates a very complex and a very dangerous situation. There is a interesting research group um, in Harvard, which is speaking of the Tukididis trap. That's very interesting. Tukididis was uh, an historian who participated also in the Peloponnesian, Peloponnesian War 300 years before uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, he has described the change in the hegemonial system in the Greek world some 2,300 years ago, uh, where the hegemony between Sparta and Athens was uh, overthrown. And they have, this Harvard group has examined 16 cases in world history um, where such changes in the hegemonial order took place and they came to the result that in 12 cases there was a, a war it led to war so you see that's very dangerous and only four uh, provided such a change uh, in the international order without uh, a war economically this would mean uh, that if the trend of using the economic war for geopolitical purpose continues as it is in the moment it would, would split the world economy into camps uh, with competition rivalry enmity between them and uh, as an african proverb serve, uh, says if elephants are fighting the grass is suffering and of course, uh, this trend, if we can't stop it, will absorb financially, materially, politically, and intellectually so many resources of mankind, mankind that we are not capable uh, to manage and to overcome 
big humanity crises like climate and environment, fighting global poverty and global pandemics. In other words, uh, if there is not a new type of cooperation of peaceful coexistence, uh, including on the economic sector, the world will run in a very unsecure and dark future. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Peter, for that insightful and, and very comprehensive um, overview. Um, now we have Baroness Dayon Aku Adnuvu. Um, she is an IPB council member and the founder and leader of um, International Education Connect Agency, which supports capacity building for the socioeconomic development in Ghana and um, sub-Saharan regions. Thank you, Baroness. Thank you, Alexandra. Hello, everybody. And um, I'll go straight to my presentation. Um, I'll read and make it um, brief. <laughs> okay, so it's um, um, since the dissolution of um, USSR in 1991, energy relations between China and Russia have generally marked, have been marked by um, cooperation and a regard for mutual geopolitical and strategic interests. Permit me to say that the war in Ukraine could actually be the first ever in history that one of the warring parties is almost exclusively confronting its opponent with economic instruments. Though many countries have condemned the Russia invasion, only a minority have notwithstanding adhered to the economic sanctions implemented by the major Western economies. Critically assessing this conflict, it is evident that not only the inviability of the territory is at stake, but also the sanctioning method of Western economies and by extension, the geoeconomic vision that has governed the world until now. Typical of many Western countries, China has formulated its stance on Russia-Ukraine war in keeping to its general foreign policy approach and its perception of the value and purpose of international alliances. China pronounced publicly on the war has, con has been confined to a few messages from the very first day of this um, invasion. The invasion has both the US and the West to blame, not apportioning blames anyway, and not Russia alone, because they have constantly ignored security concerns for Russia especially. It also is very important to establish a common security concept in this region and the world at large that's made, that must take into account the interests and concerns of all parties, which is not dominated by the West or the US. A few points on China's stand on this matter includes the following, that the West should recognize the principle of indivisibility of security and which holds that the security of one country should not be fulfilled at the expense of the security of other countries. And also that this principle becomes the basis for a new international security framework and architecture to be adopted. This is also important to drop the Cold War mentality and block notion shifting and shifting to multipolar pragmatic international system in which non-Western countries can play a more decisive role. China does not support unilateral Western sanctions against Russia because the US uses the sanctions as a way to expand its influence and geoeconomic reach. Now let's consider the few pros and cons um, for China. 
just to touch briefly on a few. Nevertheless, it's, in, it's difficult to assess at this point China's stand in international relations. This war has created certain opportunities and risk for Beijing. And Beijing is still trying to evaluate and assess properly. Among the risks are the toxic political situations threatening China's reputation and image abroad because, China, because of China's close ties with Russia. Political and ideological polarization in Southeast and South Asia is increasing. The war has added complexity to China's relationship to Russia and the Western economic sanctions enacted in response to the war have created challenges for Beijing in carrying out their Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, as these sanctions and related financial restrictions are likely to impact the transport of goods through Russia and Belarus. In addition, the war in Ukraine has established grounds for further consolidation of the NATO alliance, which China sees as aiding US geopolitical goals. Both Moscow and Beijing perceive NATO not as a defensive alliance, but as an instrument of American expansionism. That's to my view. On the other hand, the war has opened opportunities for China. A frail Russia, in quotes, could move Moscow away from the West and closer to Beijing as China's junior partners, or um, as um, um, maybe um, little brothers, I would say. In which, um, and that is exactly how China has seen Russia um, and uh, that is exactly the relationship they have had over the years. The war has also pushed China to become more active in expanding its influence in Central um, Asianic and South Asia, which Europe and US are burdened with hawkish policies towards Russia and domestic social and economic policies as well. Even if China is poised to play a role in mediating a ceasefire in Ukraine, it could insist, it would insist that it would be on an equal playing field, a level playground as the US and the EU, which could only be possible after Beijing has reached an agreement with Brussels and Washington. This is what actually makes China have um, contradictory ideas about fully supporting either party in this war. Now, back in Africa, we have our own fair share of common security issues. Food insecurity, threats of political unrest lately heightening, incredible inflation, economic downturns, and a host of social economic related problems not talking about the effects of the climate change, only Africans understand. And so only Africans can solve. In all this, I trust and I'm hopeful that a peaceful negotiation will be reached very soon in this war. So we can all have some peace, especially Africa to concentrate on very, very, important issues in our region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baroness. Um, now we'll move on to Professor Anu Chenoy, um, Asia Europe People's Forums um, from, sorry, from Asia Europe People's Forum Security Cluster. Thank you, Anu. Uh, thank you. Thank you, IPB and uh, everyone for having called me. And I want, I'm very grateful to Peter and Baroness for having laid out, uh, you know, the, ma the major issues. And I fully agree with uh, what uh, they have said. 
and endorse it. And uh, therefore, um, all I'm going to do is try to expand on uh, uh, what uh, they have said. So of course, uh, and I have just five points on that. Uh, first, of course, I agree that there is a high, very hybrid war, uh, not just against Russia, but also on China. And I believe the nature of this war is such that it appears to be a war against the global South and Europe because we are the ones who are affected. So, um, you know, if you see the impact uh, or who, who benefits and who is impacted, this war is moving out and uh, impacting, um, uh, uh, you know, many more rather than just Russia and China. Uh, my second point is really about uh, unilateral sanctions. Now, there are two types of sanctions. There are the sanctions from Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter and, and other, um, um, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which were levied, for example, on Rhodesia, South Africa, Yugoslavia, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda, which had international consensus uh, and for, for real, uh, for very important uh, re strategic reasons. But these unilateral sanctions, they're under US domestic law. Now that doesn't extend to the rest of the world. So these are completely illegal in terms of international uh, law. And if you see that, you know, these kind of, that is why the Global South opposed, has opposed all, every one of these unilateral sanctions. They've been against uh, Iraq and uh, hundreds of others. And I'll just cite some examples. For example, since just the 1990s, there were 193 sanctions. And out of these, 80% were on African, the Middle Eastern, the Latin American and Asian countries. And out of these, uh, on 60 occasions, out of this, uh, of these sanctions for in 42, there was un, um, the United States military involvement in, in, in the global south. And, but none of these sanctions through the 90s, none of them were really effective uh, as uh, for the reasons that Peter showed uh, in his very comprehensive uh, uh, paper. So I believe really that these um, sanctions uh, are um, they have a racial uh, element? Uh, there is a politics of otherization uh, and phobias. Uh, this time, the phobia is against uh, Russia and, uh, of course, uh, China. And uh, why I I am saying this uh, is because if you see, for example, when. Uh, President Biden put the America Competition Act or the CHIPS Act uh, earlier this year uh, in January uh, 2022 uh, 20, on uh, China. Uh, when he introduced uh, the act in the House, uh, he said that these sanctions, and I'll go into what those sanctions are later, but just see his speech. He says these sanctions are to promote democracy in Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang and counter Chinese presence in Latin America, Middle East, and assess Chinese political and economic security in Africa. And, and I say in quotes, he said, to show China and the rest of the world that the 21st century will be an American century. Now, who told him to act on behalf of Africa and Asia to make sure, you know, that the Chinese, we have to assess ourselves whether China or Russia are a threat. And sure we did, because you can see what happened in Africa. When Blinken went to South Africa, the foreign minister of South Africa, she said that this CHIPS Act and the second act, which came a week uh, before or later on Russia, which was this countering Russia's malign activities in Africa Act, the foreign minister of South Africa said, in front of Blinken that this, and I quote, is malign legislation. And she said, I appeal to African countries to have relations with whichever countries like Russia or China that they feel fit. So the South really and Africa is speaking back 
they have agency and that is why they have rejected unilateral uh, sanctions uh, unilaterally across without having to have any kind of meeting or center or center command control, which tells them, yes, we, we need to reject this. We need to have a neutral position. We need to have strategic autonomy. They have spontaneously uh, pushed uh, back because I think historically, and finally they feel that this is, there is a racial tilting in this sanctions uh, regime. Of course, for Russia and China, this is not the first time, except as again, Peter showed, these sanctions are much, go much beyond what was there during the Cold War, um, you know, which because they um, freeze uh, Russian reserves, some, you know, billions, which is an illegal act. Uh, they have um, this uh, countering America's adversaries through sanctions act, the CAP CATSA. There is a missile uh, technology control regime, which will not allow, um, you know, uh, any kind of uh, uh, transfer of technology uh, and so on. And so forth. these are not uh, difficult uh, to look at. And of course, they try to exempt those, uh, uh, those aspects, which, are useful for the West. So for example, titanium, why was there no sanction on titanium which comes from Russia? Because it is used for the jets made in the US. But so therefore these countries then have hit back and decided not to export oil uh, or gas or titanium and, or these commodities to, to the West. So that is one of the reasons why these sanctions uh, are uh, are really uh, are failing. Now the um, uh, um, the the Chinese Chip Acts, which cuts off the semiconductor chips, uh, it also uh, says not only should uh, should any country not export uh, chips to uh, China, but no exports of U.S equipment in, chip, in the chip making industry to China and no US citizen can work in a sanctioned company or even repair e equipment. Uh, and uh, the UK goes even a step further. They have uh, kind of issued a law which sounds to me like some kind of decree in which they say that there should be no academic exchange between any British institution or an institution with Russia or China. So you're cutting out you, you know, even your academic exchange. So how do you get to know what these countries are saying or uh, what people there are saying or, or analysis? And that is why I believe even Yale, et cetera, have gone so wrong. Their huge studies have said that Russia will collapse in two months and they've gone wrong. They couldn't predict the Soviet collapse because they're not even allowing their analysts to study or engage with these countries through these sanctions. And therefore uh, the sanctions, you know, both Russia and has shown re re resilience. Of course, there will be a long-term impact uh, on them on, and on, on the global South in terms of food and fertilizers and the cut in supply chains and the sanctions on even um, if any ship uh, which takes this, these equipment uh, is not going to be insured by Western um, insurers. Uh, so uh, of course uh, they are very harsh, uh, but these countries have hit back precisely because much of Asia and Latin America and Africa are not prepared to take this anymore. And I just want to give my fourth almost last point is for example, what is happening with Russia and India and Russia and Turkey uh, and, and uh, Russia and Indonesia, et cetera, where all of them, what, uh, you know, they don't see either Russia or they do see, you know, they have issues with China, but they, they can deal with these themselves. They don't need any intervention or support from the West to provide them with security. So for example, when the US pressured their multinational companies of oil and gas like Exxon and others to exit. 
force them to exit from uh, the Russian Far East, where they were producing, or they had huge shares in, in oil fields. Now the Russians have uh, offered these to India and China. So uh, India, for example, has now huge investments in the Siberian gas fields, um, uh, Sakhalin 1 and 2, uh, as does China. Uh, and um, uh, they uh, have new kind of legislation and deals to make their own transport corridors to get them. So basically, they're saying that uh, you know they're gaining from the exit of uh, European, uh, not so much European, but especially the American companies, but perhaps also European uh, big uh, big giants, uh, and even smaller countries like Kazakhstan. I read the the president statement yesterday, who who said, "Yeah, we are for a multipolar system, and we want both the Russian and Chinese uh, roads and transport." So whether it's Central Asia or Africa or the smallest country, uh, they are opposing these kind of sanctions. And uh, there is a trickle down impact therefore, which uh, is turning uh, them uh, basically, um, they don't, don't want block politics, but they are crit critics now of NATO, especially as NATO is expanding into the Asia uh, Pacific. Uh, further, for example, uh, the dollar and euro are obviously going to get hit. And I just give one example. The Asian countries now have four hundred um, dollar billion dollars worth of currency swap agreements between themselves. Uh, so Asian trade is going on through these currency swap agreements, and so they don't need the dollar as they did in the past. And now they're in negotiating with Qatar and Saudi Arabia to buy their oil in local currencies. All the processes are not in place. There is no immediate threat to the dollar, but, but these particular round of sanctions and the position of the US and Europe has hastened a process where all these countries fear that they might also at some point be subject to the similar kind of sanctions and economic warfare, which many of them have also in the past. And therefore, they need to prepare for this uh, future. So uh, really, um, I think I again agree with uh, what Peter said that history tells us that the world changes at a time of crisis. And this post-Ukrainian uh, geography is going to be one where not just Asia, but uh, all of the global South is going to be asserting themselves much more than they have ever before uh, in history. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anu. Um, we'll move on to Su Yung Huang. IPB board member and secretary general of the Korea Peace Appeal. Thank you, Suyo. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Suyong um, Huang, manager of Center for Peace and Disarmament uh, of uh, PSPD, uh, NGO based in Seoul. Uh, Thank you to our colleagues who prepared uh, this timely webinar today. And I, I learned a lot uh, from previous speech of uh, our colleagues. Thank you. And I would like to talk about the impact of NATO's expansion and the strategic competition between the US and China on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. Uh, I think everyone feels that today's world is very different from the world we have ever experienced. Uh, the integration of globalization is collapsing and fragmentation is deepening. Uh, it's uh, a chaotic situation. Uh, this, uh, which is said to be a multipolar system, is different from Cold War. Next, I would like to talk about some seriously concerning points. 
Uh, the first one is about the intensification of the U.S.-China competition. Um, recently, a series of diplomatic events were held, including G20 summit and U.S.-China summit and ROK U.S.-Japan summit, but it was hard to predict peace or co cooperation anywhere. Uh, the leaders of the U.S. and China agreed that there would be no new Cold War, but uh, blockization and militarism are intensifying uh, day by day. The escalation of the U.S.-China competition threatened every country, whether neutral, partner, or ally. At the root of the competition between the U.S. and China, there is an accelerated change over two decades. China grow its economy much faster than the U.S. Uh, China has surpassed all but the U.S. in terms of nom nominal GDP. And the pandemic and trade war have taught every country that they must stockpile daily necessities and make diverse supply chains and avoid relying entirely on trade a potential enemy. As a leader, there is a clear movement to reorganize the, the supply chain so far. Uh, and, uh, and the U.S. defined uh, China's growing military hegemony in Taiwan and or the South, Ch South China Sea as a threat. China has built a strong military force for the past 20 years. As a result, the possibility of armed conflict between the U.S. and China in the Taiwan Strait has intensified. This year's series of events uh, greatly increased the risk of war between U.S. and China surrounding Taiwan. Uh, the second point is NATO's expansion. Uh, NATO recognized Russia and China as a common security threat and has pursued a shift toward uh, NATO, a uh, global military alliance. A new uh, 2022 strategic concept was adopted at the NATO summit in June. Uh, they, this includes the expansion of NATO's influence in East Asia. Uh, of course, it is Russia that NATO now recognized as the most significant and direct threat, but NATO evaluate Euro-Atlantic area is not at peace in the 22 summit. In response, NATO has warned uh, to plan uh, to increase troops in Europe, increase uh, missile defense, as all of you know. And the new change is about China. 2022 new strategic concept. China was mentioned for the first time as a NATO strategic concept. NATO note that uh, authoritarian actors are challenging NATO's interest, values, and democratic democracy, and suggesting that China is included. The Indo-Pacific was also mentioned for the first time in this strategic concept and pointed out that the situation in the region could have a direct impact on European Atlantic security, which is also important for NATO. Uh, under this text, the NATO summit was the first to involve for Asia Pacific partners, uh, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, very symbolic. And the third point is the recent movement by the South Korean Yoon Song Yeol government. Uh, yesterday, a uh, mission of uh, uh, Republic of Korea to the NATO opened in Europe. Uh, South Korean mission says it institutionally cooperative relations to and actively participated in activities in on various issues. Uh, this is a uh, foreshadowing of future change in the future, further change in the future. 
uh, we are seriously concerned that South Korea continues to move deeper into the U.S. center side that aims to pressure against China and Rus Russia and strengthen um, its military alliance. Uh, in the face of deepening militarism and confrontation around the world, uh, the South Korean government foreign police is increasingly clear that it, it will join pressure on China, fully riding on the U.S. Red Military Alliance and ROK U.S.-Japan military cooperation and strengthening cooperation with NATO. There is no independent and balanced strategy for peace. Uh, these policies are likely to increase military tensions in the uh, Northeast Asia region and strengthen the new Cold War structure, uh, leading to a threat to peace on the Korean Peninsula and the safety of the residents in Northeast Asia. In addition, the South Korean government is making it clear that it will join the U.S. center's order both mili militarily and economically. It has, uh, a South Korean government has announced a series of participation in the in, in the Pacific Economic Framework and the Chief for Semiconductor Consultative. Uh, however, the impact of these uh, things has not been fully examined. Uh, these are the plans of, for the U.S. to reorganize the, its supply chain with the aim of, um, uh, aim, of, aim of keeping China in check. Joining the initiative to sustain the U.S. center's international order will have a long-term impact on the economy and industry of South Korea, which has the largest trade volume with China. Uh, the South Korean people are deeply concerned about this, uh, the security and foreign policy that the government focuses on the ROK-U.S. alliance. And the crisis on the Korean Peninsula is so serious that, it's not, uh, that it is not unusual for uh, armed conflict or at any time. South Korea, the US, and North Korea are announcing and practicing preemptive strike strategies against each other. South Korea and US are strengthening their uh, aggressive military posture by strengthening extended deterrence strategy, deployment of US strategic assets, and expanding joint military exercises between South Korea and the US and the Japan. And North Korea's response to this is also getting tough, tougher. Uh, as South Korean and the U.S. practiced the operational plans, including preemptive strikes and frequently deployed the strategic assets such as F-35 uh, fighter jets that can drop the tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea has announced a nuclear law that includes a nuclear strike strikes and preemptive nuclear strikes if the leadership is threatened. Uh, military tensions are rising without an ex exit. Uh, under this circumstance, the strengthening of a confrontational structure between South Korea and US and Japan and North Korea, China and Russia make it difficult to build peace on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. Uh, the Korean Peninsula people uh, were also living in the Cold War during the post-Cold War period. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is a reason with the this fire in the world. Therefore, pre armed conflict on the Korean Peninsula and transition from unstable uh, armistice and preventing it from becoming the front line of the U.S.-China conflict are the most important task of South Korean civil society as for now. And we will focus on the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign, Peace Campaign to End the Korean War uh, for the seventh anniversary of the Armistice Agreement next year. And I talked about this issue with my colleagues a while ago. Uh, we say that uh, we feel the world we face is not an era of post-war, but an era of pre-war. The World War 
wall feels closer than ever. So it is I we think it is more diff, important than ever to continue to call for peace and disarmament and cooperation and common security against militarism and blockageation of economy and world. And, and countries and people affected by the US-China competition should gather to stop the cliff edge fight between the major powers. Uh, we should continue to demand us that solidarity returns, not confrontation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Suyun. Um, finally, we have Ludo de Brandeburg, um, who is a writer and spokesperson for Belgian peace organization, RADA. Thank you, Ludo. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Alessandra, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm a spokesperson of uh, Vrede Visitory, which is a, a Belgian peace organization. So in the country where NATO headquarters is um, in, in Brussels. Um, I want to focus on uh, mainly on uh, economic warfare, but also the military part of it um, in um, Ukraine. And so the geopolitical struggle between Russia and uh, the West. So maybe you remember Lord Ismay, he's often been quoted in articles, the NATO's first uh, secretary general in the beginning of the 50s when he said that the purpose of NATO was to keep the Russians out, the Americans in and the Germans down. And so today, this hasn't changed due to Washington's confrontation strategy, partly through uh, NATO, the US succeeded to oust Russia from the European energy market. Remember how President Trump imposed sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in 2019, targeting companies involved in its construction as part of a policy to disconnect Germany from Russian, uh, not only German, but mainly Germany from Russian energy supplies. The US became the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas uh, this, in, during the first half of the 2022, so the first half of this year, filling partly the vacuum left by Russia. And this year alone, between January and October, approximately 48 billion cubic meters of LNG was exported from the US to the EU, which is uh, more than double uh, than uh, the full uh, last year. And this was already quite uh, much more than 2020. So for the current economic war between the West and Russia over Ukraine, we have to go back to 2013, when Kiev was under pressure to choose between an association agreement with the Re European Union or a customs union with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. And the industrialized eastern part of the country was more likely to benefit from good trade relations with the old Soviet Union countries to the east. But for the more Europe and world oriented agricultural West, an association ag agreement was more interesting. So at the time, Kiev's choice for a custom union, customs union led to a popular uprising in Kiev and the fall of Yanukovych. A war of nationalist character broke out in the Donbas, home to a large minority of ethnic Russians. And four months later, the European Union and Ukraine, Kiev, signed an association agreement. And the change of power in Kiev led Russia to annex, this was before, of course, to annex Crimea to prevent Ukraine's pro-Western course from ending the Russian military present, presence in the strategic peninsula. So to come back to the recent uh, events, soon after Russian troops invaded Ukraine in late February 2022, NATO's member states opted and, and their allies opted for a massive arming of Ukrainian troops coupled with economic and financial sanctions in attempt to weaken Russia on all fronts, on all those fronts. And these sanctions have three components. They have partly already been explained by Peter, but one part of the sanctions targets the oligarchs with the seizure of overseas assets and the imposition of entry bans. In addition, uh, extraordinary financial sanctions have been declared, such as freezing central bank reserves and cutting off key Russian banks from the SWIFT system. And finally, heavy restrictions on technology exports to Russia have been coupled with pressure on 
Western multinationals to move out of Russia. So as a result of the sanctions, almost half of the 640 billion in foreign reserves have been re frozen. And the embargo on parts of electronic components, vital for both military and civilian uh, goods, is also already making itself felt. Russia is a major importer of high tech. So more than from the US and the EU. More than 1,000 multinationals stopped or reduced their trading activities. Hundreds of oligarchs have been individually sanctioned. And the impact of the sanctions comes on top of war costs and the brain drain of young Russians trying to escape military mobilization uh, or authoritarianism from Moscow. So according to several recent estimates, Russia, Russia's economy will shrink by 4% this year. But the impact is much less severe than was planned. Months later, it, appear, it appears that the sanctions are not having the attendant effect, uh, the effect to bleed the Russian war machine to death. And in fact, the sanctions are having a perverse effect. And I think I repeat what Peter said, that due to scarcity and speculation, oil and gas prices have soared, allowing Russia to earn unprecedented revenues, even with reduced exports. Moreover, Russia is in the process of gradually adjusting to the sanctions and is counterattacking by cutting ties with the West and redirecting exports to countries like India and China. On the other hand, the effects are being felt worldwide and a recession is looming, a worldwide recession is looming. A Russian countermeasure um, more in particular, decreasing gas supplies to Europe caused sharp price hikes on the energy market that put the European economy in serious trouble, as has been explained also by Peter. Large energy intensive companies are already having to shut down. In sanctioning countries, inflation rates of more than 10% are now being recorded, as, and this is severely affecting purchasing power. Um, of the common people. Even worse is the impact on the poor countries of the global south, where the number of people suffering from hunger um, and forced to live in extreme poverty is increasing at a frightening rate. According to the International Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, food prices have risen 20% this year, and 345 million people in the world, primarily in the global south, are in ac acute food insecurity a tripling compared to the period before COVID-19. So as in any war, there are also war profiteers, such as currently the energy companies, the arms industry, and the big players within the agribusiness. The four major, major agro-multinationals, among them, for example, Cargill, that together control more than three quarters of the global grain market, have seen their sales and profits soar. In the energy sector, Britain's Shell already posted 30 billion in profits this year, and the year is still not finished. And US oil giant ExxonMobil is even heading for 50 billion in profits this year. With many people unable to pay, to pay their energy bills and far too little investment in clean energy resources, the energy giants are planning even an increase in profit distributions. So the price increases we are, we are experiencing are just exacerbated by speculative stock markets and are a consequence of the monopoly positions these multinationals have. And so it's a systemic problem, problem in general um, due to this domination of this, um, in, in the market of these uh, companies, these multinationals. Now, Ukraine's successes on the military front are now reviving hopes in NATO capitals that Russia can be defeated on the battlefield. But that seems, not in the short term anyway, to be a viable option. The war strategy by military and economical tools aimed at weakening Russia rather than bringing a swift end to the war threatens to further increase, increase these catastrophic fallouts, as I would call it. The Kremlin will not surrender unconditionally. It still has nuclear weapons in reserve. And, in the, and the potential for further negative consequences is undeniable. In an extreme scenario, social discontent grows in the global south, which can, for example, give food riots uprisings, 
and in Europe, popularity for far right parties uh, rights as well. Uh, to give just a few possibilities uh, or examples, and so it's necessary, I think, to put a quick end to the violence in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine for many reasons. First, to stop the huge uh, loss of young lives in both camps and further destruction. Second, to pro protect the people's purchasing power, avoid further world hunger and poverty and, and stop the war profiteering. Third, to avoid a dangerous nuclear escalation. The scenario for a military victory over Russia uh, has another major drawback. It will hamper a political solution for the national conflict in the Donbas, and so in Ukraine itself. Moreover, this could lead even in an extreme scenario to a dangerous destabilization of the Russian Federation, which is not an attractive scenario with a nuclear armed power. So it's therefore necessary to obtain a ceasefire as soon as possible to create space for negotiations that can bring a just and lasting peace agreement that also offers a political way out uh, for Russia. In the words of Pope Francis, um, and I quote him, let the guns be silent, let the universal ceasefire be declared at once, let negotiations capable of leading to just solutions for a stable and lasting peace be activated soon before it's too late. Let dialogue be resumed to nullify the threat of nuclear weapons. And so to conclude, last weekend, 100,000 people took the streets of Rome in a rally calling for a ceasefire in negotiations while expressing solidarity with Ukraine and condemning Russia, Russian aggression. That so many people took the streets was partly due to the active mobilization by the trade unions. And in their appeal, they highlighted the global social environmental costs of the war. And I quote them, the war swells up everything and blocks the hope for a more just and sustainable future for generations, generations to come. So I think let's follow the example of Italy and work on the creation of a global anti-war movement with the active involvement of trade unions and other social movements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luder. Um, I'll open the floor now for um, some questions. Unfortunately, we do have um, a limited amount of time. Um, so please raise your hand and we'll, we'll get started um, with questions for our speakers. Okay, it looks like we um, have a question um, here. So I, I can't see the name, but feel free to um, unmute yourself or write in the chat as well. Uh, okay, I raised my hand. <laughs> I don't know why you haven't seen it. Uh, my name is Christina Kash, and I'm the co chair of the Noto War Noto. NATO network. And I think the last words of Ludo were very important for me uh, because I uh, think it's very important that we increase our, the, our forces and uh, enlarge our peace movement. And we have heard about the blockades in the first uh, discussions which are used against Cuba and all the success. And now the European Union are doing the same thing uh, with Russia, also with all external effects of uh, other countries not involved in the situation. And therefore, I think we sh should see how we can enlarge our uh, movements and how we can uh, counter all these possibilities. And for me, of course, most important point is the foreign minister meeting of NATO uh, the upcoming uh, weekend in Bucharest and hopefully there will be some protest. And the next point is to prepare the NATO summit, which will take place in June next year in um, 
new at least Zunia. And I think this is a very complicated place for peace activities. But uh, the NOTO NATO network will try to do actions like it have done to all the NATO summits since 2009. And we will uh, try to have a uh, hybrid counter summit uh, and, of course, webinars like this in before to prepare all uh, these actions. And definitely, we will have a peace wave against NATO and militarization, like we did it last uh, counter summit in Madrid. And hopefully this year with a broader participation like this one in Madrid, because we have more time to prepare it, but this should start also now. And hopefully we will have a first preparation meeting uh, still in this year to start with the concrete working. That's from my side. There's more comments and a question, of course. Thank you, Christina. I might put a, a question forward um, um, for Baroness. Um, I was just wondering, Baroness, you mentioned, I mean, of course, many of the, the economic sanctions um, in the global south are, are quite clear um, and obvious, but I was just wondering if you could um, perhaps give us some examples of the, the consequences on the ground that you're experiencing in, in Ghana and, of course, um, in other um, sub-Saharan African states. Um, Green, um, the sanctions, um, it's, it's actually the dollarization um, that is, is, is actually affecting um, the Ghanaian economy because now um, it's even difficult for um, a typical, um, like, like for our government to um, even find um, um, financing to um, support the importation of, um, of rice, of, of table rice, because um, yes, we do grow um, rice in Ghana and, and parts of Africa like um, the Sahel, but um, we still do need the, um, 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 the support of, of, in, of imports. Yes, and, and most of it have come from, um, from China and um, um, some other parts of um, um, Russia when it comes to Bali and um, some other grains. It, it is becoming um, extremely um, difficult for us um, to raise those financial instruments um, as a country. It is, it is um, putting um, a heavy load on our um, economy, causing a lot of inflation. And even where we have um, food coming in, um, the inflation is such that um, the purchasing power is, is gone down and we cannot afford to buy staple food like um, bread and uh, maize and, um, and rice to feed families. So it's just deepening the already impoverished nature of, of where we come from. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's really um, tough. Thank I you. don't know if that answers your question. No, it, it does, it does. Yeah, especially with the food insecurity and yes yeah. food insecurity yes. yeah and then of course with petroleum and um, that it's, it's obvious as well yes we do have um oil um here but we we don't refine it goes back mm. to europe and um we we need to get it refined and it comes back to us and then again dollarization and then we, we can't afford to even buy fuel it's it's it's, it's it's not easy here. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. I think if we if we don't have any honor, oh we do have a question from Jeffrey Darnton. Have 
me just switch on. I hope everybody can hear now. All right. Yeah. 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 Good. The um, <clears throat> I I just wonder if we should be changing the narrative a little bit because so many people have been commenting about countries doing things. Now that's very anthropomorphic. Countries don't do anything. People do things. And therefore, the narrative really needs to focus really in the spirit within terms of the IPB. Uh, the narrative should change and focus on the individuals who are responsible. Because wars don't happen by countries. I mean, if you take soldiers, soldiers don't declare war. Ordinary people don't declare war. It's individuals within governments and power structures who declare war. And also doing a lot of work with business schools, I'm just re thinking of the the old business school saying that if you don't know what's going on, follow the money. And of course, the uh, if we look at the amount of money that's, I mean, a cruise missile up to two million dollars. Somebody made it. And somebody's making money out of making the cruise missiles that are flying around the Ukraine and Russia and so on. And so I think the narrative really needs to come down to the individual rather than countries. And, and another thing that I'd be curious to ask is whether or not the IPB would be interested in or in organizing a tribunal. I was one of the organizing members of the London Nuclear Warfare Tribunal back in the 1980s, and eventually that followed through to TPNW. And if we take the um, uh, what followed on from the London Nuclear Warfare Tribunal, I wonder if IPB and, and people related to IPB would be interested actually in putting together a new tribunal uh, to discuss things like Ukraine and so on. So that's my question to members of the panel. Do you think it would be worthwhile organizing a tribunal a little bit along the style of the London Nuclear Warfare Tribunal to look at some of the issues that have actually been discussed so far in this webinar? Thank you, Jeffrey, that you brought up certainly some thought-provoking um, points there. Um, I do believe it may be a conversation that we need to um, continue after the webinar. Um, we will move on to Kate Hudson, who will be um, giving us her closing remarks um, for the event today. Um, Kate is an IPB board member and the Secretary General of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much, Alessandra. And can I just uh, thank all the speakers? I mean, I've learned so much. <laughs> it's incredible and such a lot of uh, really, really important detail. And it's good to know that it's been um, recorded and we'll be able to watch it back and encourage others to do so too, so that we can have outcomes from this that can help us move forward. Um, I was, I suppose, I'm sure we all agree with uh, the way in which Peter opened um, his presentation that weaponization of the economy isn't new, but it's reaching new levels. And of course, we see that every day on our, our TV screens and how it's used for global geostrategic reasons to maintain US global dominance. Um, and I think that for me, listening to all the speeches, that's that's what I've taken from this, really, that there is an, the key to understanding this is to understand the overarching issue, which is that the US is, is struggling to maintain its global domination against a, what is pretty much an unstoppable trend that has been ongoing for a couple of decades, you know, towards a multipolar world. You know, we've seen BRICS and so on. We, um, now, fortunately, with the change of government in Brazil, I'm sure that Brazil will be coming back up and playing a really positive role there. But this is something um, 
that the United States can't stop, but unfortunately it hasn't really realized that or doesn't want to realize that. So it's putting all this massive military and economic in, uh, effort into um, trying to prevent, in particular, um, as Sue Young was explaining, you know, to prevent the rise of China, which is rising economically and has been doing so for the last two decades at least. You know, so it's this; it, these are these are trends and moves and so on that can't just you can't just put some massive great amount of military stuff in the way and expect it to be prevented. And of course, um, Peter warned of the Thucydides trap. And of course, that is what is so important for us as the peace movement um, is to prevent this kind of US attempt to prevent the natural development of economies and societies and multipolarity to prevent that resulting in war. And there are many reasons for us as the movement to oppose war, but also to oppose sanctions. And uh, that's been really important from this, uh, this discussion, how we protect civilians from sanctions because they are the victims, not the people that are in theory being targeted. We have to oppose NATO. Sue Young made very important uh, comments and others too about um, the expansion of NATO and NATO's role as the kind of, a kind of US military um, kind of enforcer and expander, so to speak. We have to prevent a catastrophic global nuclear war. And we have to work to stop loss of life. I mean, there are so many challenges associated with this one focus. And of course, um, as uh, Baroness and others uh, mentioned also, and Anu as well, about the impact on the global south, you know, on uh, hunger um, and shortages and economic recession and, and those kinds of elements. So for all those reasons, it's essential for the peace movement to be um, really focused around this, but to understand it as a kind of whole issue not just to get kind of preoccupied on one small element to understand the overarching. And of course, what's also come out in the contrib contributions, Alessandra, I think very strongly is the need for a new type of cooperation um, to deal with the global problems, for example, climate change and, and other massive global problems. And uh, Baroness outlined um, the common security approach, and I'm sure uh, all our movements are now embracing the common security approach, approach, and of course IPB and others launched that important new report recently. Um, the principle of indivisibility, um, for example, and uh, rejecting the dominance of US Western interests and NATO um, uh, for their global uh, uh, profits and so on. So. Um, very, very important, all those things. Um, I was uh, very struck by what uh, Anu was saying about um, the, being a war on the global south, but also the role of the global south in bringing around change and transformation. I, I come from an anti-nuclear weapons movement and the role of the global south in leading uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, has been absolutely second to none. There wouldn't be a, a global nuclear ban treaty without the Global South, you know, and they've led on the a nuclear disarmament issue for decades, including trying to make progress uh, within the NPT. So th that role of the Global South as leaders, I'm sure, will come to the fore as well. I'm sure that's already the case in terms of achieving um, achieving common security and, and peace for the world. And so um, finally then really to, to touch on um, Ludo's point, you know, about the, the kind of crucial role of the global anti-war movement, a absolutely. And of course, it's just, I think it was just a few days ago, the 20th anniversary in uh, Florence of the, um, first European Social Forum, which launched the Day of Action uh, against the war on Iraq, which led to millions out on the streets in February 20, 
uh, 03. You know, so those kinds of things are very inspiring, but there are also many lessons for us about the importance of that. And I think Luzo uh, was saying about the role of the trade unions, you know, that is the organized working class in many countries and, and the power and strength of that solidarity. So I think together we can build on that. And I welcome what Christina was saying about uh, plans for um, our work to counter the NATO summit next year. So there are, there are many things we can do. We have a shared understanding about militarization, about economic warfare and how we oppose that and how we want to bring peace and common security. And I thank the IPB for organizing this webinar, which I think is helping us develop along that path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. And thank you everyone um, for the rest of us, the rest of our speakers and for everyone who joined us this afternoon. Um, hope to see you in our next webinar. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, colleagues. Thank you very much from Russia. Thank you.